Gemma Haigis, Lucia Sarmiento, Albano the Madman and Philip Fjellstrom are four different musicians from four different locations with four different individual backgrounds. One thing they do have in common, however, is their shared experience of suffering through the process of learning this slightly ridiculous piece of music, Bel Horror. It all started in the Balkans sometime before the 16th century with a form of folk dance that has come to be known for its ak-sak rhythms, in other words, limping rhythms, rhythms where the beats are different lengths. In various styles of Balkan folk dance, short and long beats can be combined and recombined to form different kinds of dances such as the Pajdushko, Kopinitsa and Sandanska Horo. A couple of hundred years later, some European ethnomusicologists decided to document the contemporary variations of some Balkan folk dances by recording them and by figuring out a way to transcribe them. One man in particular, Bela Bartok, decided that some classical music was feeling a bit stiff lately and decided to inject it with some of the vernacular music of the regions he had been visiting, like Bulgaria. The use of European folk motifs in the 20th century classical repertoire is a little like when jazz musicians started playing popular music forms like funk and rock in the 70s. Classical folk fusion became a theme for composers like Bartok and Stravinsky. The inclusion of folk elements in classical music was nothing new. Even in medieval motets, vernacular languages like French were being used alongside Latin. But the use of European folk song in 20th century classical music seemed to popularise a particular use of odd metre in genres outside of the original folk dances. In this regard, particularly of note is American composer Frank Zappa, who was openly influenced by both Bartok and Stravinsky. This use of odd meter pervades Zappa's work, which according to prominent LA session drummer Ralph Humphrey was unusual for popular music at the time. During a similar period, big band leader and trumpeter Don Ellis was also bringing rhythmic influences from India and the Balkans into his music, and this is especially evident in his piece Bulgarian Bulge, which borrows a typical Aksak rhythm from Bulgarian Sadovska Horo, which was shown to Ellis by composer and pianist Milko Levyev. Humphrey has worked with both Zappa and Don Ellis, and his approach to tackling odd meter was central to how I approached writing effective kit parts for the Aksak rhythms. For example, in Bulgarian Bulge, Ralph retains the conventional role of each component of the kit. He keeps time on the cymbals and uses the kick and snare to emphasise certain downbeats and upbeats, shaping the sense of phrasing. There isn't much syncopation. The priority appears to be to clearly outline the metric structure, and this is also true for the parts I wrote for Bel Horo. This differs from drummers like Stoyan Yankulov. In his performance of a Kopernitsa, Yankulov plays around the 1116 clave and deliberately obscures the downbeat. For Yankulov, the meter is nothing unusual, whereas in Bel Horo, the way the meter shifts and changes is a central structural feature, and the frequent changes especially demand clarity rather than ambiguity. The kick and snare are used traditionally in Bel Horo to establish a backbeat. This begins with a rhythm based on a 22-16 dance called Nanyova Horo. Once this rhythm is established, it continually mutates, shifting its accents and forcing the kick and snare's placement to continuously adapt to the changes. This aspect of the kit's role is similar to Bulgarian Bulge, only Bel Horo places much more emphasis on mixed meter. The kit parts in Bel Horo are also very involved, playing in unison with the melody and collaborating on its rhythms with little triplet fills and such. In addition to timekeeping, the kit's role here is to reinforce and embellish the melody. It is used in a similar way in Zappa's Dog Breath variations, where Ralph is often playing in unison with the bass part in the 9-8 and 5-8 bars. The difference is that here, Ralph is reinforcing the bass because the melody often crosses the bar line and ambiguates the downbeat, whereas in Bel Horo, the drums are embellishing the melody since its interaction with the bass part is clearer than in Dog Breath variations. So it's fairly clear that Bel Horo's DNA includes Bulgarian folk dance as the essence of its rhythmic identity and draws upon the work of 20th century classical and jazz composers when it comes to its handling of melody and its arrangement. But how did modern musicians deal with this, and what previous experiences did they relate it to when they tried to play it? Philip Fjellström, the drummer for this piece, cited some of the music he used as a point of reference. I'd say that Balkan music, uh, Ivo Papasov meets Dave Brubeck, the Blue Rondo, with a twist. 
The measures are mostly built on groups of twos and threes in a similar way to Balkan music, so it felt natural to have that approach. I haven't been in the business playing uh, that kind of music, but uh, I've been listening to a lot of it. There's one interesting group from Norway called Farmers Market that are doing some pretty interesting stuff. Interestingly, Philip also contrasted his approach to this piece against the jazz fusion material he often plays with the Swedish group Krona. I'd say that uh, the stuff that we're doing with uh, Kronan is more jazz fusion oriented. It's not so much static groups of twos and threes. There are more air between the uh, beats. Gemma Haigis, the keys player, made a connection between Bell Hollow and Frank Zappa, which seemed to act as a point of orientation when it came to approaching the melody. It reminds me a little bit of Frank Zappa, like definitely just like the, it's like a pretty much like a continuous like crazy unison, and that's like that's how I kind of hear it. And I figured out that it was actually kind of like a call and response sort of thing. Like there were there were parts that were, it wasn't just like a, this is a constant melody that never stops. How does the melody itself work? As the harmonies were written first, the main theme was simply developed by picking out chord tones and interpolating them with passing notes. There are typical call and response structural ideas as the contours of the phrases alternate direction. Certain cells were picked out and developed into different sections maintaining coherence between the several contrasting passages. A common theme is the chromatic transposition of cells following a descending contour. This technique emphasizes the interval choices of the given cell and helps to create an interesting syncopation in instances where the cell's length is greater or smaller than the length of the beat. Similarly, there are isomelodies within which variations of the melody are embedded simply by changing which note of the cell is accented. Although Bulgarian music serves as the basis for Bel Horo's rhythmic identity, the meter changes are not just lifted from different Bulgarian dancers. In his treatise, The Technique of My Musical Language, French composer Olivier Messiaen described what he called augmented and diminished rhythms. To augment a rhythm is to extend it, and to diminish a rhythm is to shorten it, and by applying this idea to the beat structure of Bel Horo, I was able to create an environment in which the melody developed unpredictably. So if the harmony came first, how does that work? The central principle of the main sections is moronically simple. I've set up tensions on the long beats, often in the form of sus4 chords, and these resolve on the following short beat, building up to a new tension. The tune modulates around a bit because sometimes the outer voices of the sus4 chords resolve upwards instead of the fourth simply resolving down, but there's no functional significance to this, it's a merely cosmetic choice. Albano's winds are a major contributor to the textural role the harmonies play. He recorded each voice twice, doubling each on his clarinets and saxes. This enabled me to pan each individual voice widely, allowing each voice to be clarified in the mix. And I was able to make some arrangement decisions that would have been less practical if the harmonies had been recorded on keys as per the original plan. So we have some historical insight into where this type of music comes from, and we also have some idea about how the players engaged with this. But what was the result of all this? The truth is more terrible than you probably imagined. <laughs>